Oh. I'm, I'm also... All right, so we are recording, and so today I'm with Jesse. Jesse, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. I'm uh, I'm quite excited about this, and I guess maybe just to kind of call it the pink elephant. So this is our first time, you know, chatting. Uh, we should probably tell people that. And uh, you know, recently a friend of mine uh, told me about you, and you know, and then I think we crossed paths on Twitter and. The internet did its magic and somehow we here we are and so i'm i just i i don't know a whole lot about yourself so i'm excited about this and and also the project the the book that you've written on bitcoin or about bitcoin so really really pumped jesse so glad to have you here um so why don't we i guess start with yeah why don't we start with your story <laughs> yeah i'll uh you know we were, we were we chatted for about a minute there just before we we jumped into recording i'll uh I'll go back to diapers sort of for you rather than the start of my career. But basically I was, I was born and raised in Toronto. Hmm. Uh, I, I did my undergrad. So my university at McGill, which is in Montreal, I studied economics and philosophy there. Uh, afterwards, I started working in retail banking and I started right as the financial crisis got underway. So I, I started in the fall of 2006 at, you know, the bottom rung of the corporate ladder at, at Royal bank, which one, which is one of Canada's major banks. And sort of had this front row seat, if you want to call it that, to, you know, some of the ongoings of just the average person during a financial crisis. And at that time, I basically found that everything I was taught in school about economics was theory. And theory doesn't always translate in practice. So what happens in the real world, you can't always draw from the theories you're taught. And Basically, I, I spent a couple of years, I, I was, you know, the short version is I was red pilled on Austrian economics, which is that, you know, different perspective from what you're taught in, in mainstream academia about economics. So learned to look at the world through that perspective and basically spent several years from to that early 2007 onwards, literally teaching myself economics just from my own vantage point using this Austrian lens. And that was, you know, a big part of my career like that, that in a sense that gave me, it, it felt like it gave me a leg to stand on. Like I finally felt confident talking about economic affairs, financial affairs, because I, I could finally rationalize it in my head. Whereas prior to that, I couldn't. I, I, sorry, by the way, I, I know a lot of, a lot of like Bitcoiners, they, 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 it, it is like either Ron Paul or Liberty or yeah something to do with, you know, eventually Austrian economics and sound money, right? But but what was it about Austrian economics? Do you remember that? Or first of all, how well, did it come to your attention? And second of all, what was it about it that caught your attention? For sure. So the reason it was brought to my attention, it, it was actually a friend of mine. So a, a buddy of mine who worked at a marketing firm down the street, we would go grab lunch every, every once in a while while we were working. And he was like, oh, have you heard of this guy, Peter Schiff? And, you know, that's a name that's very going to be very familiar to a lot of Bitcoiners, mostly today because he's so anti-Bitcoin and pro-gold. But if you were to have been introduced to him in 2007, before Bitcoin even existed, and when money was, you know, and the, the, the reason that I found his arguments and his ideas very attractive was because it was, you know, plain as day that money was just being debased in front of our eyes, right? Like, we're taught that, oh, yeah, that, you know, the government you know, the government has this debt. You look at their balance sheet at the time, whether it was 10 trillion or 15 trillion, I don't even remember how many trillions ago it was. And then suddenly they can just, oh, we printed, you know, we found this extra $600 billion that we're now going to give up to banks. It's like, but you're in debt. And if we had that money before, why weren't we using it? Oh, you just made it up. So, you know, it basically begged me to ask the question, what is money? And you know, if someone can just make it up from nothing, then wh why do I work so hard for it? You know, like I have to earn every dollar I make, but someone else can just snap their fingers and create it and create it on mass. And it takes them no effort whatsoever. And so that really put this bug in my head about money, like, like seeing what was happening in the real world where the central bank at the time for, for TARP or whichever stupid program they had come up with at the time, um, was going to print six hundred billion dollars, and then subsequently they did more money, and that just and, and of course it, it went directly to certain specific institutions. It's not like this was a blanket everyone gets an equal share of money. It's no, we're just going to give it to these organizations that we need to save. It's like, well, why do we need to save them if if they fail? Because other businesses can fail, and other businesses did fail. What happens is savvy people who actually saved up money 
or who shrewdly maybe can can raise investments from from other people who have money will go pick up the pieces off this scrap heap and then assimilate it into their own either new or existing businesses to make them more efficient and actually work better. But instead, we're allowing these failing companies who have who very clearly had these failing business models to continue failing. We're, we're subsidizing them to continue failing, and that's what we're a paying our taxes for and b devaluing our savings for. So you know, those ideas started to really form. And, and I was in my early 20s at the time as I'm starting to think about and contemplate all this stuff. Um, and so I became effectively a gold bug in 2007. And from, from there, from my retail banking job, I, I worked there for a few years, went into wealth management after that, where I worked with a broker who was like-minded to me in the sense that, you know, we were both very interested in gold and found that it had those sound properties. And that's something that oh, if the world returns to that, well, we might see, you know, more responsibility in the world. That's, that's the only possible thing that can rein in this recklessness of the world. Um, and so that was sort of my thesis in 2009, 10, 11, et cetera. And I had heard of Bitcoin when it came out in 2011. I mean, sorry, I obviously I know it, it was released in 2009, but it sort of got on my radar in 2011. And me and a few of my friends in the wealth management business at the time were thinking, well, maybe we should throw a few bucks at this thing because we understood the principles of there are only 21 million units or coins. They will be issued on a predetermined schedule. Um, they will become harder and harder to mine as time goes on. And these coins cannot be just printed for free. There, there's ongoing competition and there's a real world cost in, in computer processing power to actually generate these coins. So I understood those principles. I didn't know the first thing about, this is again, back in 2011. I didn't understand the first thing about blockchain. I didn't actually understand anything about proof of work other than it was somehow energy intensive. And, you know, we wanted to buy some because it was trading at like a buck. Um, but we didn't know from this technology and there were no resources telling us, here's how you open a wallet. Here's how you private keys. It was very, you know, niche at the time. And so we didn't act on it. And, you know, basically Bitcoin proceeded over the next couple of years to do its rock and roll roller coaster thing where it would go up, you know, a thousand percent and then down 80% and then up 700%, you know, I, whatever the numbers were just up and down and up and down. And so it was sort of in the background. I went about, you know, my career for a few years. I went, I went back to school, I got my MBA and ultimately went into management consulting first for a financial services consulting firm. And then for a, a company that specialized in market research. Um, and it was in 2017 that I basically got reintroduced to Bitcoin via Ethereum to a certain extent due to a friend of mine who was a big, was and is a big Ethereum fan and uh, basically had my first experience actually using and experimenting and under, okay, this is what happens when you stand the transaction, you have that nervous exhilaration. Oh, I bought it from an exchange and now I'm sending it to my wallet. Why is it taking 10 minutes? Is it going to get there? Is it going to get there? And once you sort of, once I at least had that first experience, it started to solidify the value proposition of Bitcoin. And from there it was, you know, going down the rabbit hole, learning more and more and more, A, about the technology, and then B, combining that with my understanding of sound money and Austrian economics and sort of all those kind of blending together and manifesting with, you know, Bitcoin being sort of this premier example of what sound money can be. And yeah, and then, and then the book was just sort of this accidental but awesome offshoot that that arose when I just I knew I wanted to contribute to Bitcoin. I didn't know exactly how I could do it because I'm not I'm not a programmer, right? I don't I don't know from um, from from that stuff very much. But I understood the value proposition, or at least I I think I did. And so I thought, okay, well maybe I can communicate that to people because it's a challenging subject, and maybe I can find a way to make it very friendly and approachable for them. And 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 the end result is this book that I have. So, so I guess maybe, yeah, so I definitely want to spend some time on that book. And by the way, is it like a, a book for anyone, for children, for... Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I would say, pro you know, it's not for grade school children per se, but I think a high schooler can read it and understand it. Um, mm. And it's definitely for both people who are, you know, curious, but unfamiliar about Bitcoin and also people who are very, very familiar with Bitcoin. Uh, because mm. I've taken a lot of... 
ideas and arguments that are already out there, right? Like it's, it's not like I, I'm, I'm reinventing the wheel with a lot of these arguments, but I've taken a lot of ideas that are out there and I'm trying to put it in this package that is very easy to go back and reference if you want to, you know, refresh yourself on a certain argument. Um, but it also, again, just the actual physical presentation in terms of how I've structured the book, how I've baked in Bitcoin's culture to the book, how I've added in these literally full page images and, you know, different graphs and charts and models to really help the reader, like visualize some different aspects of Bitcoin. It, it really makes it, I think, a, a resource that can be very valuable for a lot of people. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's one that is very easy to just share. And yeah, I, sorry, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent Okay, now. so it's okay. So I, I want to I wanna, I wanna go into the book. Uh, but before we do, so in terms of your story, so you said born and raised Toronto. Um, did you say you studied uh, business then? Or is that so what, it, what it was? It, or did you go into the, the kind of the banking world directly? Yeah, so my undergrad, I'll, I'll give you all a bridge this. The undergrad was I, I, I went to school from 2002 to 2006 at McGill where I studied economics. And then I worked for seven mm -hmm. years, basically between retail banking and investment advisory or, or wealth management. But then after that, I went to business school. I did my master's and, and got my MBA in business school. So that, right, and that was in right. 2014, 2015. Interesting. And, and so, so you actually studied economics in university, right? And so curious, um, so, so, so the lens that they take is is really just like the Keynesian school of thought. Is that is that what it is? And do they just like do they like even is there like a footnote? Do they have like like a little side piece on like hey, there's this thing called Austrian economics? If just in case you're you're curious or anything, or is it always like nah, that's not even me. yeah. So that's the thing. <laughs> that, that's the thing, right? Like the, the the general you know premise, the general theory that you're taught is is very Keynesian is based. And money as like, if you consider it as like an actual substance or an act, the actual thing that we are moving around to exchange value, it's basically taken for granted. It's, it's just an assumption is sort of the easy way that I, that I describe it. We don't, you don't really go into the nuts and bolts of what makes good money and why. Like those questions are not really answered or discussed very often in, in Keynesian theory. Um, and yeah, there was very, I, I never heard in my studies, the name, you know, Mises, Hayek, like Rothbard, like those names never, ever, th these are Austrian economics. Um, those names never, ever came up in, in my undergrad studies. So to suddenly become exposed to them when I was, you know, starting out my career and reading their work and going like, A, why did no one ever tell me about these guys? B, oh my God, what they're saying, I can actually like understand and and you know rationalize and apply this in the actual world how come how come this wasn't i wasn't exposed to this I, I i thought i studied economics apparently i only studied this one portion of economics interesting interesting yeah hmm. okay so uh and so you <laughs> say you had this uh you had this uh somewhat theoretical but like you know steeped in kind of the traditional you know uh, keynesian economics viewpoint and then you got into the real world you're working in you know the big banks i mean technically you're supposed to be like a money expert so you know people are probably looking at you as like well you've got it all figured out you um, <laughs> you would be you would, you would be amazed at what a lot of bankers do not know <laughs> mm, yeah 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 it's funny how like all of us are so um somehow we get pigeonholed into just being so narrowly focused on like just doing one tiny little thing that most people don't have the time of day to just step back and be like, what's going on here? What, like, no, what, the, and, and what most, is this money thing? <laughs> and, and, and most of the bankers I worked with in the early days, right? They're, they're only gauging measurement based on sales, right? It's okay. How much am I selling? It's not, what am I selling? Is this a good thing to sell? You know, does, am I selling the product that is actually right for this person? It's no, no, I just need to push product because that's, what's going to make my manager happy and happy and help me get promoted. But like, do I even understand the funds I'm putting clients in or do they even need this product? Like for a lot of my colleagues and, and maybe not a lot, but a, a handful for sure. You know, it's them first and not putting the client first. And it, it, it was funny. I, I remember vividly having discussions with my manager all the time. She goes, you know, Jesse, like you're bright, you're smart. Like, I, why aren't your numbers higher? Why aren't your numbers higher? And I would tell her like, all my clients are happy. They like me. They keep coming back to me. I, I'm, I'm getting, you know, why am I getting, 
compl- uh, pa- uh, patients. Why am I getting clients complaining from this banker and that banker, like from my colleague over here, my colleague over there? Like, why are these people asking to see me in the, and I'm not selling? Like, shouldn't you be happy that like I'm actually fulfilling their need and like you have satisfied customers? Like they would actually recommend me. They, they want their friends to come see me because they think they're going to get the, the truth from me because I, I'm not trying to push product on them. I'm trying to genuinely help them given the you know narrow tools at my disposal. Whereas again, you know, a lot of people are just incented to, well, if I push product, then I can get ahead and that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, no. Well, I mean, I think it's kind of fundamentally recognized or appreciated that we all want to make more money, right? Whether it's like a little kid or like a grandma, everyone. There's, and there, there's nothing but wrong to what with end? self-interest. But I mean, how often do people just stop and like ask them to like, to what end and like, what purpose does money serve? And where does it all come from? And how is it that like, these pieces of paper here on my printer bed are worth nothing yet. The pieces of paper in my wallet are supposedly like people will give me steak for it. And you know, it's like, how does that like do not compute? So, okay. So anyway, so you, you go through this kind of traditional um, kind of uh, educational background, then you go through the actual machinery of, you know, the, the financial system, if you will, and quite possibly what maybe one of the top five, 10 banks in the world and you're still left utterly confused. And then you discover Austrian economics and you're like, okay, this is starting to make a bit of sense. Uh, but then what, what happened? So you said then, then gold became kind of a central point or a focus in your life. But yeah. I'm just curious, like how did it go from like gold to kind of like the Bitcoin uh, part of it? Like where, where, yeah, like what were those threads in between? Yeah, no, it, it, it was a, you know, multi-year process, right? There, there's no one moment where it just all snapped and came together. Um, I I learned about gold while you know again before Bitcoin came out. So I understood gold as you know the best version of money that the world had known. That was mm-hmm. my understanding at the time, and I think that was the correct understanding at the time. Bitcoin comes out, and it's again it's very new. It's uh, you know it's unproven. The network is still relatively small and relatively low value. So, okay, I can't envision this thing as, you know, the world's reserve, future reserve currency just yet, but I see some merits to it. I'm curious about it, but I, but because it was something that, you know, my skill set, I, I couldn't figure it out, how to use it, how to navigate it. I had to just sort of, you know, be hands off. And it was, you know, something I, I would know about in the background as the years go by, but not something um, I pursued, you know, and it's easy to say, oh, in retrospect, I wish I had pursued it. But at the same time, because I didn't, maybe I, my appreciation for it grew over time. And as I eventually would, would get closer to it. Um, and so my career and my, you know, my studies, cause I, <clears throat> pardon me, I went back to get my MBA, right. Those sort of took center stage as they, they do for everyone, right. You, you're trying to find your place in the world. And so, it just, it was just sort of by dumb luck that I got. And, and, and Jesse, like in terms of like, what I guess maybe it asks you different ways. Like what, do yeah. you, what if, what did you see since then that maybe Peter Schiff hasn't, right? Cause there was one point, like he showed you this oh. way into this new world of like gold and money and Austrian economics, but Peter's still kind of stuck there. I mean, his son has come forward, it seems a bit, but, um, but I'm just curious, like what, and we might be wrong too, right? I mean, the experiment hasn't played out to like the end of eternity, like the future is indefinite. Um, but but what, it, what, what kind of maybe benefits of Bitcoin did you start to see and could kind of, kind of like extrapolate from and be like, okay, wait, this is like, maybe not gold, but it's like a digital gold. Right. So it began with, I, Funny enough, my, you know, education in the Bitcoin space began more so with blockchain than Bitcoin, right? You know, Don Tapscott Mm. um, came out with blockchain revolution. So, okay, I read that book in 2016 and I'm starting to think about, okay, well, how does this apply? And, you know, we had this big rush in 2017 where we're going to make a blockchain for this and a blockchain for that. So, you know, I'm as fallible as anyone else. I got caught up in that hype Mm. and was starting to rationalize oh yeah, we could use a blockchain for this. We could use a blockchain for that. And it was, again, a process of learning the difference between sort of the blockchain, a blockchain for everything and the real purpose of blockchain, which is to basically prove its own scarcity um, and why that scarcity matters as in, in the function of money. And really, you know, the idea of absolute scarcity for a money was something that hadn't really occurred to me until, you know, reading, reading guys like, like Safety's book, 
um, you know, and, and with his stock to flow sort of pitting gold versus um, Bitcoin as, you know, gold will always have this flow because we can constantly kind of dig and discover more. We don't actually know where the gold supply in the universe ends or even on mm-hmm. planet Earth, right? We don't mm-hmm. actually know where it ends, mm-hmm. whereas we have a very definitive ending for the supply of Bitcoin. Mm. And then explaining the economic rationalization for that as a money, how Bitcoin as this, you know, if you look at it as this public scorecard for managing or for measuring, pardon me, money and value, mm everyone is always checking the same scorecard with gold. There's going to be little bits of variations because we're not hundred percent sure. And then with fiat, there's wild variations because there's so many of them. And well, there was, I just I, recently read, there was like some fi- last year, some finding under some temple in India that like, you know, that was like, it, 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 like, it was massive. Like it was like, it would have, I, I think it represented some massive percentage of what the country's holdings would be. And, and then you think about like, uh, you know, Elon Musk, SpaceX, like what if they find a comet? Yeah. So the, you're, you're yeah, right. You, I think that hits to the heart of it, which is like true scarcity doesn't really exist with gold. And then combining that with, again, the understanding and the real fundamental purpose of money to be this medium of exchange that can measure value with like pinpoint precision, right? We can, we know because the scale 21 million is the scale is perfectly fixed. We always know that we're measuring, you know, how many sats is this out of 21 million? Are those sats worth it? Right? Like with that, that's the scale. And that will always be the scale in Bitcoin. Whereas the scale with gold is slowly getting bigger and bigger. And with fiat, it's, you know, just going off the charts. So how, how can you use fiat to measure value it, it's an unstable measure of value yeah okay and, 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 and so yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so so that clicking and then basically and, and you know in the book i i have several pages obviously going on of the sort of knock-on effects of what that means for uh the efficiency of trade versus the inefficiency of trade when you have money whose value is constantly distorted you're you're losing the plot of like what is the value of this and that in that confusion becomes the air that fuels financial bubbles Whereas with Bitcoin, because it's always fixed, the price adjusts based on what the actual value is rather quickly. Um, and so you very quickly can figure out, okay, this is the actual value for something. So I actually know whether or not it's worth it. I, I can very quickly determine, am I overpaying, underpaying, whatever. It just, yeah, it, yeah. It, gives, it, it gives you a lot more clarity. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I just I just remember this like tweet that what one of my like ex coworkers tweeted out this morning saying that he, something to the effect that he took this girl uh, he he had met this girl back in 2013 2014 she was living in a different city he had liquidated eight bitcoins to to fund these flights and things didn't work out with the girl but you know but but the bitcoin <laughs> has left him and he's like he real the lesson he learned was is that you know if you're good to bitcoin it'll always be good to you um but like you know uh, I, I i i agree though i think i think it, gi- it gives you like a thermometer against all other you know assets in the world and it's something it's like a dependable supply okay so what what next then so i guess at what point like i mean you're working in the bank you studied economy you get, you don't program. I love the fact that you you just said, well, I don't program, uh, but I'm still going to do something because Bitcoin, you know, programming is like one one hundredth of like what it actually is. This is like way bigger than, than you know, yeah. becoming a core developer. It's, it needs people like everyone, right? Um, yeah. But what, what made you kind of figure out, well, you know what, I think, uh, I think I've got a gift for writing here. I think I can write a book because <laughs> that's a big yeah, leap. <laughs> I, it, oh, it was definitely a leap. There's no doubt about it that that was a leap. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, you know, I, I've sort of maybe told the story a couple of times now. It, I never saw myself as an author. I, I never expected I would write a book when I left my job of thinking, okay, I'm going to somehow be involved in Bitcoin. I, it sort of started as this like a PowerPoint deck where I was going to try to explain to, I guess, high net worth investors. Okay. Here's the value proposition of Bitcoin and why maybe it's worth a couple points of your, your net worth. And okay. I'm going to try to explain it with, some some quotes and just some you, you know my, my own twist on language if you want to call it that that can maybe I think try to frame arguments and, and hammer certain points home to to really again make it approachable make it friendly but also you know impactful and this thing just ballooned to like 80 slides and I'm having beer with a buddy of mine one afternoon and he's like dude you, you can't show this deck to anyone but you have a great skeleton for a book like you should consider turning this into a book and I again I hadn't thought of it at the time but I slept on it. And the next morning I woke up and I'm like, oh yeah, of course, like that, that's a great idea. Well, why not give it a shot? Like I, I, 
I'm, tr I'm already putting in this effort to explain ideas that are complex and foreign to very many and put them in sort of simpler, friendlier terms. That's a great model for a book. Like pe people want to learn about subjects. You know, a book is a, is a good way to, to spread information to a whole bunch of people. So I made the decision. And then once I made that decision, it was sort of off to the races for me. Like I, once I committed in my head to the idea that, yeah, I'll, I'll see this through and I'll try to write a book. Why not? It was, it was, it was just like gangbusters. I was just, you know, having ideas and, and coming up with, you know, one liners left, right and center, and then, you know, moving them around and stitching ideas together and trying to, you know, thread, thread needles and connect dots. And, um, and yeah, so, you know, it took me a year. It's not a particularly long book. There's like 125 pages of text, right? And it's so it's a 150 page book on Amazon, uh, all told. So that's with the end credits and whatnot. Um, and it's the format I kept basically this a, a very similar format to the PowerPoint where every slide is like, okay, I'm making like one main point, one big idea. So I kept that format to the book so that you can very easily read a page, get an idea. If you don't understand it, you can sort of quickly scan that page again or read it again to make sure you dig digest it and then move on. And then also if you're either going back, you know, if I reference an idea when you're further into the book and oh yeah, Jesse mentioned proof of work. How does that work again? Okay, I'm going to go back and figure that out. And oh, there's the page. It's one page. I read it. Oh yeah, that's how that works. Now I can keep going. And then also, even if you've read the book in its entirety, you can just go back at any point and find any single argument very, very easily because every single page has its own title, which references the argument that it's making. Uh, and then plus all the, you know, the analogies and the, the, uh, the, um, the Bitcoin culture that's in there, the the images, like it all just sort of works, I think, very well together. Okay, so so uh, uh, I, I'm <laughs> yeah, really curious. It's no, well, well, no, okay, well, okay. So I, uh, I don't even know where to, where to start, but okay. So I, <laughs> I like, I, I just love anyone that's doing anything in Bitcoin, and, and I'm kind of weird that way because, like, in, on this show, I literally interview like like competitors because i run a company called Udocoin in india we, we've been around for a long time and i don't just i don't see anyone as a competitor it's like if you're if you're building on bitcoin like we're friends like we're good yeah, totally. <laughs> um and so and, and i and i think that there's a shortage of artists you know i, I recently interviewed tatiana who's like a, a singer and has been yeah. you know doing a lot of cool stuff in this space for a long time and 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 i, and I feel like 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 when that happens at mass, like that's when we'll, you know what I mean? Like get like a whole new wave of like people, like normal people, not like robotic, it, like nerds and like, you know what I mean? Like well, the, it, the crowds that are in there it's, now. It's the, it's, it's the meme warfare, right? Like it mm. speaks to people. Art, art speaks to people. It can, can write a uh, picture is worth a thousand words, right? I can con convey a very deep and profound idea with one image Whereas that might take me, you know, 10 pages and, you know, an hour to explain to someone. Mm. And what was the Did you come up with a title right away? Or were you like, I'm going to get to that eventually? Or what was that kind of the process around that? And what is like, how do you even bring a book to market? Were you like, I'll just ask <laughs> Dawn. I'll just Google it. Like, did you call up, I don't know, a couple of buddies? <laughs> the, the title... Um, I picked shortly after I began writing the book and I, I had, obviously I was familiar with the, uh, the Reddit, the subreddit with the magic internet money wizard. Like, do, do you know what I'm talking about? Of course. About? Of course. Yeah. 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 So I was familiar with that. And I thought, well, like that's a great title a, because it's sort of playful, even though like, if you read my book, I, I address a lot of very serious issues. I just do it in a fun way. Right. Like I talk about very real, meaningful issues, but I try to, again, that friendliness and being attractive to almost any reader was very important to me. So I, I purposely liked this kind of playful title of magic internet money because I thought, oh, it just, you know, it's easy to pick up off the shelf. If you see a book called magic internet money, it's not. And what it is it? Is it a novel or no, there's pictures too. So what do you, what do you, what is it called? Like, yeah. <laughs> it's it, it's the, the full title is magic internet money, a book about Bitcoin. It is exactly. And it's for anyone. It sounds. It's I for mean, anyone. Like anyone. It is nice. literally anyone Sweet. who has any interest in Bitcoin. I, I would be shocked if you could read it and not take some lesson away from it. Like I, I would genuinely, for, for anyone in Bitcoin, I mean, you know, may, maybe it would be hard for me to say that to like a Robert Breedlove or Adam Back or, you know, so some of these guys who've really, really been, been in it and really been wrapping their heads around it. But to the vast majority of people that are trying to learn about Bitcoin or have been learning about Bitcoin for years now, 
I really truly believe there is a lot to be taken from the book. And it's because again, of just how I'm A, framing the arguments and B, because I had this limitation of one page, one argument, I, I was very um, meticulous with every word I chose. So I was very, very concise so that I don't waste the reader's time. I just like curious people want to get to the point. And so every page is right to the point. So, so if you had to kind of provide a bit of a teaser, right? Like pick your favorite three pages or like, I don't know, like areas or something that, that give people a bit of insight into like what they're getting here that they can't, you know, get otherwise. Can, are you able to share something? Well, how about, how about I read like uh, one of the first pages? Done. How I do that? Maybe that'll, maybe that'll work. So this is from chapter one and chapter one is called narrative. So I'll, I'll sort, this is literally page one of the book. Uh, this first page is titled Once Upon a Time. And it let starts us see with the book. book. Or let us see what it looks like or know the front of it, sorry. Yeah, I, I don't know if this is going to be audio and video. Um, yeah, it'll be both. No, okay, but the so, front of the so, book. Oh, there we go. Hey, hey, yeah, hey. Yeah, let me sort of get my mic out of the way. Lovely, so you, lovely, you lovely, lovely. Yeah, yeah, so. Oh, man, the cover, it must feel good to hold that. Oh, it feels amazing to, to <laughs> see, like, again, and, and you ask me again when, when I'm done this part about um, the process of writing a book, because we can go into that. Yeah, yeah or, I want to get Or in releasing there. a book, so, so yeah, save yeah. that, because because I'll forget. <laughs> but save that. But yeah, I know, to hold the finished product in my hand, knowing what I put into this is, but it makes me very happy for sure. So 1.1. Once upon a time, quote, storytelling reveals meaning without committing the error of defining it. And that's a quote by Hannah Arendt, who's a political theorist and philosopher. What is it about a great narrative that can be so memorable, so meaningful, so enduring? It's a community of narrators reciting a story time and again, asserting the same virtues and wisdom using different voices and emphases. Readers and storytellers recall conflicts faced by protagonists and, inv and invoke connections to their own situations. The more persuasive the story, the deeper the personal bond it forms with its audience. With the passage of time, the reverence of its status can be cemented through the reiteration of defining characteristics that are timeless. In this way, a compelling and consistent narrative can become legend. To tell of Bitcoin is to tell of just such a legendary tale, defined by a single, constant characteristic, stoicism. Bitcoin, as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic monetary system, epitomizes stoicism by exhibiting the absolute and unyielding ability to continuously perform exactly the task for which it was designed, no matter the circumstances. This perpetual determination is the beating heart of Bitcoin's potent narrative. That's, that's, that's the first thing you read when you read the book. Nice. I like it. I like it. I like it. So uh, I, I can go to Amazon and buy it. You said, is it going to oh, be yeah. at the Indigo down the street or what? One day, one, so Soon? for, yeah, for listeners, Indigo is a Canadian store. Uh, one day I hope to be an Indigo, but, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. yes, currently the paperbacks on Amazon only. Gotcha. Gotcha. And wait, hold on. So when did it go, you know, live? So I started selling it on October 20th of this year. So it was a little over a month ago. Woo! Yeah, just a little over a Man. month ago. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I have questions around like, like promotion and stuff. And, and by the way, just to kind of like tell you why I'm doing this again, it's just because like part of what I want to do with this, whatever the hell I'm doing <laughs> right now is I want to inspire other people that are kind of stuck along the way. And they're like, Oh, I can't do that. Cause like whatever reason I want to just like take away all the excuses. <laughs> no, hold on. Actually, somebody's like, right, right. On, yeah, yeah, yeah. on that train of thought. No, no, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to yeah, go yeah. with you on that train of thought drawing from this page I spoke about. So, um, it's a community of narrators reciting a story time and again, asserting the same virtues and wisdom using different voices in there and emphases right in that line, literally the second line of the book, I'm telling you Bitcoin, as much as I am teeing up my own story, it's not only my story, right? It's our story. Bitcoin is everyone's story. Every Bitcoiners story is, is Bitcoin. We tell all of us tell the same story or a version of the same story we assert these same virtues, right? The same principles that Bitcoin stands for, but we do it using our own voice, right? Different voice, different voices and emphases. So we will emphasize certain points that, you know, our perspective lends to, right? So my background in economics and banking and money, that's the, the lens and the perspective through which I feel most comfortable talking about Bitcoin. Someone else might feel more comfortable talking about it as, you know, unstoppable software and code. And that's, you know, I address that to some degree but that, again, that's not my specialty. So I 
talk about it from this particular lens, but I'm, I'm telling you right in the beginning that this is all of our story. I, the book is my version of the story and everyone can tell their own version of the story. Well, that's why I'm calling this Bitcoin stories. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah, exactly. How appropriate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect. I know, I know. And, and, I'm, and I'm starting to see that. And is this just that everybody has like the craziest and most fascinating Bitcoin stories as well. Hey, so I have a question. This book, is it like, a, it's a fiction? Nonfiction? Is it? Is there any of like, is there, does it go into like magical like characters and, and stuff like that or no? So I, you, you, the, you could almost say it straddles the line in some ways it or blurs the line in some ways between fiction and nonfiction, but it's a hundred percent a nonfiction book. Like it's, it's, I, again, it's in the cover. It's a book about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is nonfiction, right? Bitcoin is truly here mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm. real world and it, and it works and it's miraculous that it is working. Um, so it's very much a nonfiction book. And basically, again, every page goes into like a different idea, you know, absolute scarcity. We mentioned off the top, that's one idea. Um, how sound money works with economics and why sound money is good for economic growth. That's, you know, basically the subject of a chapter, which I divide into smaller points. Uh, I talk about governance. I talk about freedom. I address Bitcoin's drawbacks. I have actually, it's the biggest chapter in the book is about Bitcoin's drawbacks. Um, I go into innovation where I talk about, um, you know, a proof-based system versus a trust-based system, if you want to think of it that way, right? Currently, we ex our world is a trust-based world, right? I have to trust that the central bank is doing the right thing every time to adjust interest rates mm. or adjust the money supply. Mm -hmm. In a proof-based system, I verify the, mo that the monetary policy that was set in stone 12 years ago and will remain in perpetuity. I can verify that. I don't have to trust anyone. I can prove it. Um, mm. So I, I sort of discuss that, you know, if you want to call it an innovation, I talk about programmable money, right? You know, yellow metal, paper, coins, th these are analog monies, right? They cannot be animated. But Bitcoin, I, I, can, I can animate it to perform functions because it's programmable. And then obviously I talk about blockchain and, and the innovation thing as well. I also go into competition. That's another chapter where I'm talking about, you know, literally directly pitting Bitcoin versus fiat, one page, Bitcoin versus gold, another page, Bitcoin versus crypto, trying to very clearly you know, differentiate between Bitcoin and crypto, Bitcoin versus forks, Bitcoin versus stable coins, which now are more, more, likely, um, more likely CBDCs or central bank digital currencies. So I really, really make a, a, again, it took me a long time to do it because I wanted to do it right. And I wanted to be to the point. Um, I really try to break every idea that I felt comfortable enough talking about, break each of them down into just these individual silos so that you don't have to think of Bitcoin as this crazy complex hole with all these moving parts. You can just look at it at one piece of a time. And then ultimately, as you start to understand these individual pieces, you'll see how they all fit together, right? Like your brain will, will manage to put it together in its own way because we can only understand it from our own perspective. So that yeah, was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was really important to me to really break it down so that I'm not, how, how did you find the order of it? Like, did you just kind of do it? I guess you had it in PowerPoints, maybe just like moved it around or something. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like I, 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 I had this, I had like, the order the, actually, yeah. mm. I, I had that figured out relatively early on. I would say that I knew cause, I, cause again, I'm looking at it, you know, every chapter is broken down into those individual pages, but then all the chapters right? You can sort of build them in sequence as you think they would work together. And, there, and there's a couple occasions where, oh, I wish I could put this one page before here and then, you know, this other page later on. Um, but ultimately, it, it, I think it works really, really well where I start with, again, that narrative, right? Narrative is chapter one, where I'm just sort of setting the stage, just teeing up the book and Bitcoin in general. Uh, two is called Origins. And that's um, more, you know, more context on Satoshi on the 21 million cap, a little bit on mining and and like the concept of money from electricity, just some, you know, and, and not only money from electricity, but digital currencies um, before Bitcoin, right? Like David Chom and uh, Wade and like a bunch of these guys, they, it, it's not like Bitcoin is the first of its kind. It's, it's the first successful one of its kind, right? So I'm laying this groundwork that this is something that's been in the making for some time. And then I go into, okay, really defining money. I go into explaining the relationship of money to economics and in a chapter that I call growth. 
I go into innovation, right, which we just discussed. Uh, next one is resilience. So explaining some of the factors that make Bitcoin, you know, so damn robust and strong. Um, then we go into scarcity, talking about just starting with the fact that, you know, scarcity is sort of a prerequisite of value, right? If something is like abundant and everywhere, it, it's not, it's not going to have value. But if it's scarce for one reason or another, it tends to attract value. And there's other, you know, attributes that, that make scarce things valuable. But scarcity is, is a one is basically the primary driver of value. Uh, from there, I go into competition, which I just broke down for you. I go into governance, which is a fascinating and was a very challenging chapter to do. Uh, freedom, which again was a challenging and very fascinating chapter to do. Drawbacks, which I thought was really important to try to paint the picture that and, and to acknowledge that like Bitcoin is not perfect, mm. but, but it has you know, for, for whatever flaws or, or, or pitfalls it may have, it's not that they can't be solved or won't be solved. It's just that they are not solved yet. So trying to relay that information that, okay, here are these things that may turn you off or you may find difficult to, to, to deal with, but don't let that dissuade you from working on understanding Bitcoin or understanding that Bitcoin is continuing to, pro to progress and get better. And then the last chapter is, you know, me putting a, a beautiful bow over all of it. Nice, nice. Hey, I was going to say, did I, maybe I missed it, but did you, is there a chapter in there where you define money itself and educate people yeah. kind of like, what, is that near the earlier part, I guess? Yeah. So that's basically the first chapter's narrative, second chapter origins, right? Mm. Sort of painting that little bit of background and context. And then in chapter three, money at the beginning, I basically say what money is used for and then mm. go over the characteristics that make for good money and then sort of start explaining um, the differences between Bitcoin and fiat as the two predominant types did, of money did, being discussed. Because I create this dichotomy between Bitcoin and fiat that's sort of throughout constant throughout the book. Do you talk about the origins of money? Like how humans even like first started thinking about money? I mean, maybe it's, I don't even know if it's I, like all that well documented, I, but did you touch on any of those types of topics? Yeah. I, I like have caveman one, days? <laughs> I, I, have, I have one page called A Very, Very Brief History of Money. It's literally ah, one. Nice. one. Cute. <laughs> have, it's just, yeah, it's just, listen, like again, readers, you know, if you want to learn, go through the, like a really great history of money, read, you know, the Bitcoin standard, I would probably be the top one for me to recommend there. I'm trying to give you this very succinct catch up mm. on money. I, I cannot possibly do justice to everything that that history entailed, mm. but I'm trying to give you the synopsis of, okay, how we went from zero to where we are today. Yeah. It, 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 Cool. Uh, so I, I'm very fascinated um, and good on you to, to bring it to the finish line and get it launched. That's huge. Um, so yeah, what did that process look like? I'm like, again, I'm, I'm a bit curious. Um, not going to lie on a personal note too. I'm, I'm sure everyone, a uh, part of them thinks, you know, someday, someday, maybe when I'm retired or something, I'll write a book, but like, what did that process entail? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, especially today, like anyone can write a book, mm. right? And anyone can write a book. Um, to bring it to market, there are several steps. Number one, you you must find a professional editor. If you just throw it out there on your own, you know, it, it as much as, you know, I'm my own toughest critic. I, I am always my own toughest critic. And I, I, I can't tell you how many times I would pour over single phrases and words trying to find just the right thing. But when you get too deep into your own stuff, right, you, you can sort of lose the plot. Um, so when you have a fresh set of eyes, especially a stranger set of eyes on it, you'll be amazed at what they can find. And just, it's, it's not that they're going in and saying, oh, you missed a comma here, or, or you know, the sentence is too long. Let's, let's split it into two. It's them reading a sentence asking, you know, is this really the point you're trying to make? Are, you know, is it going about it the right way? Is, you know, just, it, it's, I don't even know if I can, uh. I guess explain it, but but having a professional editor is highly recommended, and very valuable. Is and in the like, process, is that like a website? Like, do people just go to a website and no, find no, one you need, you need they... to find you need to find a person. You need to find a professional editor. So I was I was sort of lucky in the sense that mm. when I decided to start writing a book, and I told some of my friends that I was doing it, one of my friends goes, "Oh, my brother-in-law started writing a book a couple months ago. Maybe you should talk to him." So I sort of had this guy who. Um, I could call up and who was like a couple steps ahead of me the whole process. So I was able to like pick his brain. Oh, how did you address this? How did you do that? But basically I was put in touch with someone who I would call a, a uh, publishing consultant. She's not a publisher, but she's, you know, I'll call her a publishing consultant. 
And she said, listen, there's, there's two ways to, to, to publish a book. You can self-publish or you can use a proper publisher. If you use a proper publisher, they will do some work to help you get into a lot of stores, right? So Indigo would probably carry my book if I did, if I used a proper publisher, but they will take 95% of the royalties and they will ask you to change things if they think, if they don't like the way certain things are going. And so, and you know, for them to take the royalties, they might say, okay, we're going to give you $30,000 in six months. And by the end of six months, you know, this is your deadline. You have to come up with a book. Um, and, and then they take the 95% royalties, whatever. So I didn't like that because I would lose creative control of the book, which for a book, especially like this, I had, I had to have total creative control because I, I, I do some, you know, fun, definitely fun is, is a good way to describe it. Some fun things with the book and the language and, and the ideas. Um, and then also like I, I could control who sells it, where, sell, where they sell it. Um, I wasn't at anyone else's mercy with the book. Um, I obviously I get a bigger portion of royalties. Not that, you know, selling a book is not a good way to make money FYI for, for everyone listening and for yourself. Um, it, it's more so a platform for credibility. If you want to think of it that way, it's, it's, and, uh, you know, a way to get my name out. So, you know, I have an excuse to talk to people about Bitcoin now. And, and I have this proof that I put in the work to understand it. Um, so yeah, so I, I went the self-publishing route which was sort of her advice. Um, and I think it was the correct advice. And because she, you know, had been in, she's been in the business for over 30 years, she had different contacts. So she put me in touch with a couple editors who I spoke to and basically interviewed and ended up selecting an editor that I liked. And we, we, you know, she was my effectively my closest confidant when it came to the book, because I submitted the first draft, she would read it top to bottom. I actually, most people do, I think, two drafts of a book. I ended up doing three because I'm neurotic and my own worst enemy, my own worst critic, pardon me. Um, but the having A, the editor was super helpful, but then B, you need, you can try to format it yourself. And, you know, a site like Amazon has tools to help you, you know, choose fonts and spacing and all that stuff. But there are limitations to that for sure. And again, I was using a lot of interesting creative devices in the book. So I, I just, I, ha I hired someone privately to format it for me for, um, you know, the PDF and then ultimately the actual printed book and ebook and all that stuff so that it, it would be more to my personal liking and styling and not just on this sort of, you know, more narrow criteria that would be available to me with, with uh, an Amazon platform. But then after that, once I had the PDF and once I had, um, you know, the ebook e or the, the finished product of the book, it's basically uploaded to Amazon, upload my cover. I had a designer in the city who I've known for years and years and years who I worked with, who she doesn't even do. She, like when I asked her to do the book cover, she's like, well, I, don't, I don't, I've never done this. I don't even like, I'm not, I don't consider myself a good illustrator. Um, she's like, I, she's like, oh, I, I normally do sort of web asset design. And I was like, no, no, I know you're talented. Please try. Like, let's just start and see what happens. And she did. And like, she did an amazing job and she did all the, every illustration in the book she did. And they're like, awesome. I've been posting on, Inst on, uh, not Instagram. Although I do have an Instagram account now, although that seems like a waste, <laughs> um, but I've been posting on Twitter, these images with quotes, like she did all these drawings. She was so amazing. So um, yeah, like it was a process to put it together myself. It was costly in terms of, you know, paying contractors and then my own time to, to get this all done. But I am so happy with the finished product. It's like, so, it is the, the thing that I am most proud of that I've done. So like, I, I was very, very, I'm very happy now that it's out there in the world. How much does it cost on Amazon? It can be, people uh, want to so, buy it. Yeah. In Canadian dollars, I think I have it at 22 99. And then in the U S it's 18 99. That is I awesome. lowered it. I lowered it a little for Canadians because I'm Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. So anything else on the book that you want to share? I mean, when's the big uh, launch party? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> we were, I was actually planning to do some kind of like outdoor, you know, meet me at the park or in my right? parents' dri driveway or something <laughs> and I'll sign copies and like for family and friends. And we couldn't <laughs> even do that. It was, it was so sad. Like my launch was purely digital. Um, okay. and so I've been on, I've been on this like virtual book tour basically. Gotcha, so. gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Cool. So yeah, but anything else you want to share on the book? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think it's awesome that you did this. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, to the book specifically, I mean, I, I've actually, I've said quite a lot. Like, I, I think I've really already, mm -hmm. you know, given 
not given away anything, but, but really painted a picture for, mm. for the listeners here. So um, yeah, no, I, the book, I'm very happy with it. The people who read it and then message me, like some of the comments I get are, are they make me so happy. Like you, you don't even understand when someone says, Oh my, like, this is such a good read. I'm going to recommend it. Blah, 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 blah. Like, Oh, thank you. know, uh, Do you know BTC sessions? You know who? You know yeah. Who I interviewed him like a week ago. Oh, really? Okay. So, so he interviewed me for the book a, a week or so after I launched Nice. and, and he goes, Jesse, like this book is an, an invaluable resource. I will spend 20 minutes explaining an argument to someone and I'll lose my train of thought. And it's so hard. Meanwhile, I'll go to your book and there it is in two paragraphs. Mm. And so it's like, it's such a great resource to have on hand because you can just refresh yourself so quickly on the reasons cool. for different things. So yeah, that like getting compliments like that, it, it, especially from Bitcoiners is, mm. is, is really, is really something I, I was very nervous prior to launch of like, how would people in the community receive it? Um, but, but it's been very warm and they've, they've, they seem you know, to this book is it. also available in India. I believe as an ebook it is. I, so I'm not only on, I'm not only on Amazon. I, I could, I could check for you and maybe I'll, I'll get back. No, to the reason I ask is because, yeah, because I, because I am founder of a company called Unocoin. We, uh, we have like a million and a half users in India as well. And so it'd be good to see if, you know, if people are interested there, um, you know, how they might be able to get their hands on the book. I'm on, I'm on basically every e-reader platform I could manage to get on. So it's not just Amazon, but it's Kobo, it's cool. uh, Apple books. It's, I think I'm in Barnes and Noble eBooks now. So like I, I, sh I should be somehow available in India. I, I'm pretty sure it's available in India on Amazon. I just can't remember if it's paper book and eBook or just eBook. Okay, cool. Well, anyways, so I, that, yeah, no, I thought we covered quite a bit of ground. I just didn't want to make sure I, I let you give your, you know, your space here to make sure you talk about it. Cause uh, oh, I appreciate it. Yeah. That is, uh, that is, like I said, fascinating and uh, more artists, more artists, hundred yeah. percent. It's uh, And I, I love seeing all the, all the other artists, right. Both in terms of whether they're written artists or whether they're, you know, like behind me, I got this artist interpretation of the stock to flow model. Hey, hey, oh. hey. Sorry, I got to stop doing that. You remember BTC? Yeah. What was it? Uh, I don't even remember. BitConnect. BitConnect. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> you should do a book on that. No, I, I'm I kidding. Was, yeah. <laughs> well, in, 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 in drawbacks, I talk about the fact that, you know, there's scammers in Bitcoin and that basically it's, you know, helping people understand that it's not Bitcoin that has been fallible over time. It's, it's the mm. people who try to store coins for you or for manage or saying, oh, give me your Bitcoins. I'm going to invest it for you. Have you have a couple like, of pages on like Ruja and, uh, and Quadriga founders and stuff like that. I think I, think I mentioned. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I don't talk about the the people involved specifically, but yeah, I do yeah. mention. I think by name, I know I mentioned Mount Gox. I know I mentioned Silk Road. I mentioned. I'm pretty sure Quadriga, and maybe I, I can't remember the one or two others yeah, yeah, that yeah. I have in there. But I but I talk about them and how. Yeah, well, I like, definitely. I, I got. I think I got all those. I got like I don't know at least six or seven books on my shelf. So, um, a Bitcoin books on my shelf. So I'm definitely going to add it to my collection. I encourage others to do so. Um, I was gonna. It's okay. So first of all, maybe I'll ask you. So the 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 third kind of you know American Gladiator style question that I have for you <laughs> is uh, remember that show by the way, American Gladiators. I just oh I yeah, say that I watched that as like, a kid. Come on, like how who canceled that? Like whose bright idea was it to cancel that show? That I, was like an I epic know, right? show. <laughs> it was it was hilarious. Oh yeah, you have these big you have these big jaw like brawny roid monkeys up against these like average, you know, yes, whatever yes, yes, and, yes. And, and the, and these the crazy versus... cockamamie battles yeah, yeah. where you're like banging with these, you know, nerf sticks for who's gonna fall into the water off the you know the platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was hilarious. Yeah. So so here we go. So here's my, my, my last one is 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 really around the like contrarian thinking. So like what you know belief do you think that you hold that most others in Bitcoin might disagree with you on? Yeah you you sort of you you prepped me a little bit before the show for this question but unfortunately I I don't know if I have a great answer for you right now. And I'm sorry about that. Um, so I, maybe I'll maybe I'll prompt you a bit. Uh, uh, I, so it irks me that people think that the only way to participate in Bitcoin is that you need to be a programmer. Right. Yeah. Okay. So okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll run with I'll run with that. Thank you. I I appreciate you. I, I appreciate you putting that one on a T for me. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when I when I first really sort of decided that Bitcoin is is the, the opportunity, it's the not not just investment, money, program, network, like call it whatever you want, it's not just the the thing that you need to pay attention to. 
but realizing when I, when I made that decision that, okay, I come from such and such a background. I have such and such a skill set and different, these experiences, there must be a way that I can use these things that I have that are unique to me to make a positive contribution to Bitcoin. And while, you know, I, I, I wish I had programming skills. I think that's a very valuable skill in this world, whether you're using it for Bitcoin or something else, you know, I I'm, you know, able to admit to myself that it's something I don't have. Maybe I'll study it or, or try to teach myself or learn it a little bit so that I can have a basic working knowledge, but I, I, you know, that's not my path. That's not my future. My, the thing that I realized, I guess that I can best do is, is just try to help people explain Bitcoin in simple terms, be to some degree, I guess, a voice of reason in this, in this industry, in this space. And, and not to say that, you know, my voice is always going to be right. I I'm again, I'm, I'm imperfect. I'm going to make mistakes like everyone else, but I'll make an honest effort, right? Like I'll, I'll give you my best. And so, yeah, you, you do not need to be just one thing to be a positive contributor to Bitcoin. There, yeah. there is, there is a place for everyone. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I mean, I don't even think that's contrarian thinking though, right? That's just, you come to that realization at some mm-hmm. point. You, 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 can, you can acknowledge whether you're admitting to yourself and, and, and in your dealings with everyone else that, you know what, some way, somehow I, I can be a value to Bitcoin and I'm going to do it because being a, a value to Bitcoin is also a benefit to me. Like that's the great thing about Bitcoin, right? Is that we all contribute to it and then it gives back to us in certain respects. Hey, can, you, can someone buy your book for Bitcoin? So right now, ah. no. Yeah. I On know. your website? No. It's, I, I know. I know. I know. Okay. Um, the, that'd be epic, I, right? Because like people would be like, take my money. But then, yeah, maybe, maybe not. And Christmas so, gifts. Oh, I, I know. I, it's a great stocking dude. stuffer. If you're, if you're out there, it's, it's a great holiday gift. If you want to help, you know, orange pill your family or friends, you want to. Right. Of, a super cheap subtle. And che- cheap and cheerful, sort of easy gift to give mm-hmm. that anyone can pick up. I, I think this is a good one. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so there you go there you go and then what about that same question maybe on like a outside of bitcoin any any and the reason by the way just just to preface like why i'm asked why i ask this why i like it is because i sometimes find like the best opportunities are usually in like these asymmetric kind of places where you know what i mean where most people are like nah there's never going to be something there and then some of us are like no there's something there and so that's why i like asking that but did you see anything out there today that again a truth that you hold not about money necessarily it can be but about bitcoin or anything but just about just generally speaking well well like human psychology is an interesting thing right especially when you apply it to markets right no one for the last two or three years would would ask i you know i would tell people for the last year and a half, let's say, okay, I'm writing a book about Bitcoin. I'm doing something in Bitcoin. And people are just like, okay, good luck. Like no one cares. No one was interested. Yeah, oh, Bitcoin's dead, right? Bitcoin's gone. And, you know, I'm trying to explain, well, well, no, it's not. It's, it still exists. It's just not making headlines. And because it doesn't make the headlines, you're now not paying attention to it. So it's very interesting that now as we're like knocking on the door of all time highs, literally the second, you start to get more and more people who are taking an interest. It's like, well, you know, you know me, I, I went to school with you or I did, I worked with you. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not a dummy. Like, I'm, I'm not going to tell you I'm, I'm galaxy brain, but like, I'm not a dummy. So like, why wouldn't you at least engage in conversation when I'm telling you like, oh, there's some merit here. It's only now that it's on your radar because it's higher in price that you're getting that social feedback of other people paying attention to it and other people buying it. So now you're going to buy it, right? Or, or at least take an interest in buying it. You know, people are, are very, you know, the, the herd mentality thing is real. And especially with markets, it's, it's a real phenomenon. So to go against the grain and be willing to, um, you know, I'll borrow from Fred Van Vliet, I guess, to, to bet on yourself a little bit. He's a point guard for the Raptors here in Toronto. Um, you're sort of betting on yourself, on your own critical thinking, even though it's going against, you know, the popular flow of things. That is a very liberating and empowering sensation to know that, hey, I took the time to evaluate this and think as critically Mm. as I could about it. And now to see it vindicated, it's like, I can do things. I can figure stuff out. I don't need someone else to figure it out for me or someone to tell me that this thing is right or wrong or good or bad. 
I can decide that. And, and here's the crazy thing is, is the I won't name the bank, but the bank that you work for, if you wanted to write a book about <laughs> them, uh, you'd probably have to go through like 50 layers of like compliance and most likely it would never get done. But Bitcoin, you didn't need to ask anybody, right? You just like called a couple of buddies. You had an editor here, some guy who, or lady who knows how to draw. And then before you know it, like here you are. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I, I talk about obviously banks in, in the governance chapter, actually, I talk about banks because I talk about both central banks and commercial banks and sort of the money creation process. And, and there's a governance to that, right? Like there's mm. a process to that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I give, I give him a good little, you know, kick. Yeah, <laughs> I, right? I, I, I sort of jab him a little bit. Not, not my employer, but <clears throat> the industry and, and the practices that they use. Um, because people honestly have no idea how it works. Like people have no idea how money and banking works. And if you, again, stop and sort of think critically and evaluate, wait, how does new money come into being? And, and why is it given to this person over that person? Like this is how do we evaluate who's credit worthy for a loan and who's not like, this is our only criteria or this is, you know, it really. And, and, and I love yeah. it because everybody, their number one complaint is they'll never let it work or it'll never work. But, but the thing is, is that like rarely, uh, like it, it, people just have like a, such an interesting kind of like these like blinders on like what money is and, and it's, and it's, it goes deeper than like religion or politics or anything. It's like, like when you talk about money, people get, people get really sensitive, you know, and, and, and then, then you ask them like, what is it? And the crazy thing is, is I've asked that question to thousands of, there, oh, there you go. So the, everyone's I'm, got their I'm, own I'm, definition. Is that on the back of the book or what? What, this, a, what a beautiful back, back. This is the what back, a beautiful back of the book. Woo. So for, for listeners who aren't, book, who can't, man. who for listeners who can't see it, the back of the book, I don't have a picture of myself and, a, and an explanation of the book. There's just three words. What, what is, is money? money? And, I, and, and, you know, you said your story started there as did mine, as did mine. Yeah. That, that was always my question. What is money? And I, and I ended up becoming a financial, financial advisor, broker, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. And, I get, uh, I and, and financial felt more, advice. more confused at the end of that journey than I did at the beginning. So it, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Like I, I get, I did a little bit of financial planning, right. I built investment portfolios. It's, we often focus on the wrong things and, and all of this stuff, like, especially in investing, we forget that you know, investing, all of that entails risk. The whole point of investing is sort of, you're trying to mitigate risk and evaluate risk and reward in tandem. We don't have that just pure final baseline of uh, value that when all else fails, you can just rest back on it, right? Like that's what mm -hmm. money was meant to be. You can just, if you're not sure how you want to deploy your money, you can save this until such a time as you're ready, you find the right opportunity that that is of maximal benefit to you in terms of its risk and reward proposition. But fiat, you know, makes us, it lights a fire under us to say, oh, no, no, get rid of our cash now because we know it's going to devalue. Whereas at least with Bitcoin, even though, yes, currently it's, it's value has been more volatile. If you look at it as a long-term game, it's purchasing power appreciates over time. So I am incentivized to- How is that a bad to, thing? How is that a bad thing? How, yeah, like exactly. why? How if, is if that I a work, bad thing? <laughs> if I work for money, if I'm working for money and I'm not sure what I want to do because everything I have to use it for entails some degree of risk, if I just want to uh -huh. hold off on deploying it, like wouldn't it be nice if I can just save it and then in the future when I'm ready to spend it, it's value, you know, hopefully at worst is the same and then basically based on where we are right now, it seems pretty likely that its purchasing power will appreciate in the future. So the money I earn and save right now, I can do more with that in the future. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing that Bitcoin is propelling for us. Mm -hmm. And it almost like turns the hands of time, if you will. Like I always felt like I was a hamster on a wheel just trying to, and there was always more month than money. You know what I yeah. mean? Like the paycheck yeah, yeah. never came soon enough. Yep. Um, whereas with Bitcoin, you could just like sit back and be like, nine million percent asset appreciation over the last nine years baby like let's go let's let's yeah. earn more of this let's work harder let's like you know what i mean and 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 spend yeah. less and waste yeah, less let's, let, and let's save, save more, more create exactly. value consume yes. and destroy less ah. like the, the lessons that bitcoin <laughs> teaches right the lessons that it teaches yeah are the things that will make the world a better place but until sure you take the so. time until you take the time to understand it money will just never make sense to you. 
Mm, mm. And so I've tried to do all a lot of the heavy lifting for you. I tried to do all this work so I condensed it and made it really easy for you to just get up there, to there, speed there with these, all like, these ideas. There are these like major like milestone kind of like things that, you know, I remember, yeah, I don't even know if I should go here, but like, <laughs> like as a man, like, you know, the whole like girl thing as a kid growing up, like interacting with them was just like an enigma. But like now I'm married, yeah. I got two little girls, so I can kind of talk about it a bit, you know. Yeah. But that was like hard. That was very, very difficult to figure out like what is going on here. Money is, ah, it's like, it's the same thing, but even like, oh, it's like more, it never leaves you. It's super confusing. Nobody's there to explain it. And and it is just insane. So I'm so happy that you've taken this step to to, to do that. Um, hey, I have a question for you. Do you do yeah. you ever think about um, like do you ever think about artificial intelligence? And have you ever toyed with uh, OpenAI? Or do you listen to any of these like recent kind of you know like a lot of these smart guys are talking about I, it? And to be yeah, to be honest, I, I have not spent a lot of time learning and thinking about AI. You know, my, my understanding of AI is basically Skynet and uh, <laughs> you know Skynet and uh, and the and the Terminator movies. So no, I have not. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I have very little. I would say that's like meaningful that I can contribute to that conversation. Unfortunately, there, there, there's point. some really fascinating stuff that's happening. I was gonna say is check out check out a project called OpenAI. I think Elon Musk was actually the one of the founders of it. It's not. I don't think he's any anywhere anyone yeah. who's a part of it. But long story short, um, yeah, they have this thing. It's called GPT three. That I've heard of that. Insane. I heard that came. That was like six months ago or something. And, came out, right? Yeah. Or, and one of the reasons I brought it up is that, well, I mean, for number one, I bring it up all in all my interviews. <laughs> I just like AI, and I don't know. I kind of think about it a lot. So I like I, I like Bitcoiners' perspectives on on what they're thinking about AI. But AI, um, I was gonna say is is that there's this thing called GBT three, and they have that. What they did is some some group of guys or ladies and gentlemen put together this like piece of software where you just talk to it, and it generates code like. Like you can just make anything you want and then you just like tell it, like you don't program it, you yeah. just tell it. Um, and they've got, anyways, like they've got things that make music and then like, you know, like, like, like Tupac beats that like got by <laughs> Tupac, but like sampling of Tupac. Type. So they've got all this like crazy stuff that's happening there. And I think, you know, like the Tesla, right? I mean, it drives itself. Um, it's kind of like remarkable, right? But I guess where I'm going with some of this is that, I sometimes also think about if things like job loss driven by automation is like a potential reality and and if that's a threat or does that just mean we create a world of artists where maybe more people are doing things that they just love and and and, and I guess like the the final question really is like how do we get there like you know is it some through form of like privatized ubi where it's like voluntary based not like maybe mandated by governments because that's obviously something that we're not all excited about in bitcoin but like yeah. what is the potential solution to some of those like i don't know like you know technology driven let's say uh, unemployment and mass unemployment like like i said like if cars drive themselves that's millions and millions of people that are potentially jobless and you can't even tell them go become a programmer because gpt3 does it yeah, I so I think you know automation is there's no question in my mind like automation is a is a positive thing right it mm. makes our lives easier right we can do more it should and, or accomplish more mm. by doing less ourselves right so we're freeing up our time energy resources so that we can accomplish other things because these you know tedious or difficult tasks or whatever whatever tasks are now automated for us. Um, in economics, we get lost a lot of time thinking, oh, well, if this job is automated, then, you know, we, we won't have, we'll have more joblessness. But like, does a washing machine, a washer and dryer help your life? Because we could have more employment if we had more people manually washing your, you know, your clothes by hand and drying them by hand. Um, no, our, our lives are bettered for automation. The primary driver of unemployment is poor economic and monetary policy. Mm. I, I think there is almost no, at least in my mind, again, it's all, you know, truth is a matter of perspective. In my mind, there's no question that if we had better, you know, fiscal policy and monetary policy, we would have better socioeconomic outcomes, but we cannot possibly have better fiscal and monetary policy unless we have the hardest, best, soundest money. And so it, it, it all, like the, one of the analogies I've been using lately, Money is 
you know, the soil in which the tree of society grows. Fiat is barren, dry, you know, and it's in shade, you know, the tree doesn't get any sun. So you have this rotting, you know, decaying tree, whereas Bitcoin is offering this nutrient rich soil that's getting plenty of water and sunshine and is just blooming and flourishing. And, you know, the leaves will come back season after season. You know, you can sort of say the cycles of, you know, Bitcoin's, um, you know, adding a zero every four years, basically. Um, it's, it's just the, the changing of the seasons and it's just growing each and every, with each and every season as time goes by. And so if we want to have that robust, healthy, growing, you know, tree that provides shit, you know, shade for us and fruits and all that, like we need to have the best possible money because that's, that creates the best possible conditions for this blooming, beautiful society. Yeah. hundred percent. Well, I totally agree with that. I can get with that. Um, any questions just generally speaking that you wish I'd asked that I did not Oh man, I'm uh, yeah, <laughs> a little pooped. I'm, <laughs> I take you to the that? ringer, American no, Gladiator. I, I, I told you, I'm, Canadian yeah, Gladiator. <laughs> it's interesting. I, I I would probably make a I would probably make a brutal podcaster because like I I feel I'm like I feel like I'm not great at asking questions, but you know. Oh, I, if you watch any of my podcast, these are the exact same questions I ask. <laughs> so, <laughs> do I come yeah, off no, as being that, spontaneous? No, yeah, not <laughs> it's totally. It's a formula. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I'm not kidding. I ask the same questions, but there's there's some reason to that. <laughs> yeah, I know it, but like, no, there's nothing I wish. I'm I just you know I love the way that you know you can ask the same question to every guest, and it's going to take you on all these different tangents, right? Like I'm just enjoying the process of we get to just explore these different ideas as you sort of prod them from me, and again because I answer your questions from my perspective based on my skills and experiences. I'm going to give you a different answer than every other guest that came on. Of course. So to course. just like that process for me is, is enjoyable. You know, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't even know what to ask you. I, I, I would rack my brain and then come back 10 minutes later with, so where did you grow up? Like, like that would be, you know, like, yeah, it's pretty amazing. I, I feel every single podcast I've done have somehow it's like, it's always been like, you know, close to the 90 minute point or hour 15. There was one that was like, I could just tell was a bit awkward and uh and the guy called me after after we did it. he's like can we just redo that one like oh, i wasn't feeling in the zone i'm like yeah no problem but uh but no most of them go pretty chill like they're you know just two humans talking <laughs> both something yeah, we're excited no, about it, exactly if you just you know I, and that's what i'm now as i'm learning from sort of being on this little circuit lately is yeah you know it's all i'm doing is i'm having conversations with you know friends that i haven't met yet effectively nice way um, of saying it yeah yeah so it's just you know chatting with a friend you're getting to know people you're getting to know their ideas and we're finding we're just constantly finding common ground right B bitcoin does that it it, it we it, it is the common you know, denominator between the two of us and between everyone else who we, we speak to. Mm, um, mm, and, yeah, and, that so just, and that just makes for this, you know, seamless, enjoyable conversation, because no matter what tangent we go off to, we always have this basis that we can agree on and, and move forward on. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I interviewed uh, Anthony Diorio, who's like one of the yeah. founders of Ethereum the other day. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's just like, uh, for me, I, like, I'm not good at making enemies. Um, like, you know, I just like, like, I just think every, we're all human, like might as well get along, you know, but at the end of the day, when it comes to certain ideas, I'm pretty firm on, on things that I believe in. I just there, like tossing my ideas up against others and, you know, we land there, where they, where there's they a make. quote, there's a quote and I can't remember if it's Aristotle or I, but I believe it's some other Greek philosopher. If it's not Aristotle, that you goes, stole it I, from me. I, that goes, yeah. <laughs> The quote goes, I have no enemies, only competitors. And the thing about competitors in Bitcoin, interesting, okay. which, which is different from competitors in, you know, the, uh, the, the parallel universe that we currently live in sometimes. The thing about competitors in Bitcoin is that we realize that we can both compete and elevate each other by collaborating and we can benefit, our competition benefits each other. Whereas in the fiat world, you're, you're, you know, trying to, you know, slice, you know, get some, cut someone's knee out from under them so that you can get ahead. It's, it's your, you're taking people down a notch in the fiat mm. world. In the Bitcoin world, it's all about competing to elevate one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, what's going to make us successful. Versus, it's funny. I, I in fact, one, in one of my shows, I, I said, even that I, I, I think I said, I used the word, I love uh, Mahin, who was one of the founders of Zebpay, one of the first companies in India. And they read that, heard that. 
And, you know, behind the scenes, they'd even sent out emails to all the competitors like, look, study say they love us. We should all love each other. Like, let's all work together. I was like, yes, yes. A, a rising <laughs> tide lifts all boats, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So, okay. Just, I guess like in closing then, Jesse, what, where do people find out more about, you know, the book and, you know, you and I don't know all that stuff. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, you can visit my website, www.magicbitcoinbook.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Jayberj, that's J-A-Y-B-E-R-J-A-Y. Uh, all the links for buying the book are, are on the website, but you can also search it out on, on Amazon and, and all the other sort of e-reader platforms that we talked about. Awesome, man. Well, again, I know uh, this is our first time meeting, but I feel like we've known each other for a long time and hopefully we can, you know, remain friends, maybe do another follow-up uh, down the road whenever you're down. Yeah, I'd love that. And th- yeah, this has been great, Jesse. I'm really glad we connected. Yeah, Sonny, it was great chatting with you, man. We'll 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 do it again sometime for sure. All right, have a great evening. Take care. Bye bye. You too. Bye.